All right, so uh, I'm Vince Coppola, and I'm going to be talking about lessons learned from software development. So you would want software development to be a very straightforward process. Uh, you would start with some identified need, you would write some requirements, uh, you would take that and make a design, you would take that and develop, test against it until you could deliver by doing some acceptance testing, and then some maintenance at the end. However, when you look at the identified need, often the customers um, understand that only at a high level. They don't really have a real complete picture. Often, uh, they talk about improving what they currently do to do better than they were, they're doing now, but not really specific about what the betterment really is. That gets translated into requirements that may not be all that clear, certainly not that complete, but you have to start somewhere so the design picks up from that, um, assuming anything that hasn't been talked about yet, uh, then the developers get the code, they have to code something, so they'll code something, they'll uh, also make assumptions, and eventually you'll get to the point where you can actually test the software. And when you get to the tests, that's when things usually go south on you. So the de development process can sometimes look like this process, where you would think that the development process is a lot about code, but it's actually a lot about communication, about well, what did you want something to do and did you actually complete something, develop something that is actually useful for the thing that you really wanted to have happen? So there's, there's several difficulties in the waterfall, in the waterfall development approach. Uh, creating the clear and, and complete requirements is really difficult. It's the hardest part of the process is just saying what it is you really want. Often you don't just really know way up front of the process. What the developers do is they overcome that ambiguity in what the requirements are by making assumptions, because they're going to develop code. That's what they do. They will make good assumptions and they will make bad assumptions. It depends on what their domain expertise is and what the uh, real customer is trying to get to. Bad assumptions lead to failures during testing. Now, don't think that the developers don't test. The developers always test, but they make unit tests up and unit tests are designed to always pass. That's their whole purpose. They demonstrate that the developer created their component correctly and it does what it's supposed to do, which is great. But what they don't do is they don't take my component, his component, her component, and nine other components and put them all together and see if the system actually behaves like it's supposed to. So the development testing is not done by the, de uh, the development testing is done by developers, but that's not system level testing. That's not testing whether you're actually achieving any goals. So people have gone away from doing waterfall design and waterfall development, and instead they use an incremental approach. And the most famous incremental approach is called Agile, but actually there's 14 different uh, variations of Agile. They all have different names, they're all slightly different. That kind of process thing is a detail, and it's, 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 that's not the important part. The important part of, of doing better than the waterfall approach is to do an incremental approach. And that is to do something first, get something to test, test something realistically, so that then you can understand whether you're missing something or what, and then take that cycle, improve your requirements, and go again. So the keys to doing that incremental approach is not getting better requirements, because that's the hardest part of the whole thing. That's the part you're actually trying to overcome, is that no one can really write clear and complete requirements. It's like high school all over again. It's not a better design either. That's not a key to the process, because you can't evaluate a design without actually doing something. Testing actually will evaluate the design. That'll help you, but you can't know a better design ahead of time. So really the key is representative testing, using the software sort of like it's intended, and then while you're doing the representative testing, understanding the results. So testing is a key. You're gonna do a test every cycle. You're gonna have successes and failures, but you're also gonna identify things you wish you had. Those are gonna be missing requirements. Things that you wished you had that are not coming this cycle, be coming next, cool, you at least accounted for those. You're also gonna find out, uh, you're also going to have code that's tested early and often because every cycle you can repeat the same test you did last time and see if you've improved or, or been the same as before. So testing is a key, 
but it's not unit testing. Unit testing is not a key, because unit tests always pass. It's the system level test. That's what you really need. And a system level test is representative. You want to do something that is sort of like what the software is supposed to do, using a workflow or test data or outputs, things that actually give you some meaningful, actionable evaluation. What did the test actually show you so that you can use that information in the next part of the cycle? So let me tell you about an experience that we had where we actually were part of a big system. There were some requirements. We built to the requirements. We arrived at the test, and we didn't do well in testing. And how could we not do well in testing, we wondered. And that was because we actually, or they actually tested to the con ops that they were trying to achieve. They were trying to achieve some representative use cases, and they were trying to represent their con ops and run the software that way, which was terrific, a great idea. The sad part about it is the people who wrote the requirements had not talked to the con ops people. So the requirements didn't actually satisfy the con ops. So software that was actually developed to the requirements didn't actually pass the testing. It would have been great had we done more of an incremental approach and had found that information out earlier rather than later in the process. So representative testing is the key, but also understanding the results. How do you understand the results? Well, vehicle mission modeling is complicated. It's time dynamic, it's multi-domain, lots of technical computations. An Excel spreadsheet is a way to understand information but doesn't communicate it very well. 3D visualization, we have found, is a great way to understand what's going on. So part of understanding the results could be things like graphs and animations and pictures that help you understand what the test is trying to do and then what the results mean. So that's great. The key to the cycle is doing representative tests and understanding the results. Where can you get representative tests? Well, if you're replacing old code, you probably already have legacy data and have legacy results. So if you're replacing something that's sort of already there, you're probably fine. You probably have something to start with. But if you're doing a new capability, that's probably not true. Not many people publish a lot of results with a lot of test data so that you can just readily get it on the internet. It's just not one of those things. So you probably are going to have to generate the test data yourself. So what you need is a test data generation tool. That's what you really need. And what would a test data generation tool be? It would be something that allowed you to do high fidelity tests or low fidelity tests, depending on what you needed. You'd want to be able to compute truth data out of it. You'd want to be able to report your inputs and outputs so you can keep track of that as test data. Hey, if, if the tool actually allowed you to graph, you could understand the results as you're creating the test. That would be very useful for you in creating what the tests were. Your ability to save the test data configuration and then load it later is sort of a must because if I have to start over from scratch, that's a really, it's an awful way to proceed. If I have to, I will, but I'd rather just be able to save my test data and be able to rerun the test. I'd like to easily recompute when things are changed. That'd be great. An automation interface. I'd like to be able to script it so I can turn all of my tests into regression tests so the next cycle I can repeat the same thing I just did. Hey, a big plus, if I could visualize what the test data said, that would be useful for us because then we could understand what tests we were preparing. So I guess you're going to have to write your own test tool, which happens to be a whole other development effort, one you don't usually get paid for. So, okay, you're going to do it, you have to do it, make your own test tool up, we do it at the office sometimes too, it's what we have to do. How do you test the test tool? You're kind of back at the same problem you just had. So, what are you going to do? Back, back at home, what we have done is we've had to make our own tests and we gener uh, generate uh, a test tool and, and run through things too. And we have situations where, well, we don't spend that much time on generating the test tool itself. We spend a lot of time making sure the delivered code is good. But making the test code good is not one of the essential things. So often we find that there are times when we find bugs in the test code, not bugs in the delivered code. And we all hate that, but what are you going to do? Well, maybe what we could do is see if there's another tool out there that can be a test data generation tool. We think SDK can be a test case development tool. SDK does modeling and simulation of the vehicle motion. 
It does high fidelity to low fidelity. It can do all kinds of multi-domain mission planning from mission concepts through operations. It can do all kinds of missions, RF link analysis, station keeping, constellation design, collection planning. You can kind of make up what you want. Matter of fact, they're not canned missions. You design the mission to achieve what you're supposed to achieve. You make up a realistic representative test case that you can use to generate test data for your development effort. We'll use realistic models and behaviors. So you can have vehicles that have different types and behave like they're supposed to. They'll have uh, instruments on board that behave like they're supposed to, including even pointing behavior. And of course, STK has a 3D visualization component to it. So not only do you get the test data, you can understand the results because you can see what's happening. You can see what the tests were supposed to do. You can see what the answers turned out to be. The, the, the mission that you see in STK is not just a pretty picture. It's representative of the numbers. The numbers tell us what the animations show. You get the pictures out and animations out, you can understand the results. And of course, there are people who would say, well, but I really want the pretty picture because I'm trying to communicate to an audience that doesn't really understand as much. And of course, we can do the pretty pictures as well. So for more information, you can go to AGI.com. Thank you.